From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined with our returning guest super producer, uh, Casey the Con Pegram. K-H-A-N. K-H-A-N. Yes, yes. very important. Uh, also, most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Today's episode is a bit of a rabbit hole for us. I mean, every episode's a bit of a rabbit hole mm -hmm. for everyone involved, but... Uh, we have a little bit of backstory here. In a previous episode of this show, we explored the strange, ongoing, and likely doomed quest to find the grave of Genghis Khan. And we also discovered that is the correct pronunciation. <laughs> yes, Genghis Khan is now Genghis Khan. Like like Jenga, like the game. New no no. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Was that a, it's a reference? Comedy bang <laughs> yeah. bang. Yeah. 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 That's Carl Tart. <laughs> And along the way, we learned that not only is it uh, nearly impossible for anyone to find the Khan's actual resting place, not only is it maybe possible that people know where it is and will never share that information, but we learned uh, a lesson that, Matt, you and I learned years and years ago when we looked at lost civilizations, and mm -hmm. that is that this species – on the whole, is just terrible at holding on to or remembering anything. We've lost the location of tons of other immensely important historical figures. And sure, sometimes that's through honest, boneheaded mistakes, moments of instability and confusion as empires rise and fall. And in some other cases, it's on purpose. It's through purposeful obfuscation. But before we explore all the famous, uh, in incredibly crucial historical figures who have disappeared from the modern day, we have to, we have to admit that there's some uh, deceptive number play at work here. When you think about it, folks, most people's tombs are lost. Over 90 percent of people's tombs are lost in the big picture. But we, what do we mean when we say that? Here are the facts. Well, it's a combination of of quite a few different factors, but um, overall, there are two really important things that um, really are stick in the craw of, uh, of of your Laura Crofts of the world. Right? Um, first, tombs were expensive. And honestly, that's not any different today. If you want like a fancy burial or some kind of mausoleum or a plot, you know, land is scarce. Lots of people die. You know, it's a quite an expense unless you just want to like go the cheap route. And even then you got to pay for a damn urn. Yeah. Funerals yeah. are a racket in this. I, I can't <laughs> recall whether we've done an episode on this yet, but funerals are very much a racket, at least in the West. And, you know, if have. your family is in the uh, funereal business, I know there's the whole notion that it is a comfort and is a service you are providing. That's one way to look at it. But there is absolutely money to be made and people are often kind of swindled into overpaying for things in memory of their loved one or as some kind of tribute to them when – I don't know. It's, it's, it's the old Bernays thing that we ooh. talked about in episode one, guys. Create don't, the need. Well, yeah, create the need and then don't be swayed as the uh, consumer or the person going through some kind of traumatic emotional thing. You can't be swayed by those pleas to your emotion. So point being, this remains true today. But throughout the course of history, the vast majority of people were buried in much more modest structures or in some cases, the body was just burned. That was back when you could burn your own loved ones. Now you can't do that anymore. Not – I mean – you can't you get could. caught. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Man. <laughs> Jeez. That smell really gives it away. Or there was uh, there were things like sky burial, you know what I mean, where the funereal process becomes more important than the you know, the physical resting site, right? Isn't mm -hmm. that kind of coming back? Isn't there such a thing as like green burials or modern sky burials? Uh, I don't know about modern sky burials, but green burials are definitely huge. And in our home state of Georgia here in the U.S., there is a nearby Catholic monastery uh, that practices that's one of the only, only two places, I believe, in the United States that practices green burial. And that's a good observation too, Noel, because with green burial, the idea is that 
ultimately everything involved in the burial from the box to the – to the um, wrappings around the corpse to the corpse itself will just become part of the soil. Leave no trace, no yeah. gravesite left behind. And that's how many, many people ended their lives, right? They they were maybe in some cultures thrown into the sea uh, or in some unfortunate places, people just rotted where they fell. That's right. And as we said a minute ago, there's also the issue of scarcity of burial sites because there are just so many people. There are so many people. Especially if we look over the long term. All right, let's let's do something very cheerful and dive into some of the death statistics, the statistics of uh, morbidity or fatalities. We were able to find, in a very rough way, the number of people who have died ever, like not from yeah. 1950 on, not from 1770 whatever on. but it's, the, it's up until 2015. It's up until 2015, but I messed with the math a little. Oh, okay. I got it to 2018. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So uh, according to the Population Research Bureau, modern homo sapiens, meaning people who were more or less like all of us listening now are, uh, this, this hot new fangled homo sapien Shtick walked the earth about 50,000 years ago, and since then, more than 108 billion members of our species have been born. That's a rough number because, again, we have virtually no demographic data for 99 percent of the span of human existence. 49,000 years ago, people weren't like, hey, let's get the tribe together and figure out everybody's average age, interest, and preference for, uh, you know, type of food, type mm-hmm. of leisure. Yeah, they weren't so much into analytics back then. <laughs> Surprisingly not. <laughs> These days we can't get enough of them. Correct. Uh, but we did we did find a pretty accurate number, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, man. If we do a little simple math, uh, we can find some astonishing things. So let's take a fairly accurate number um, of people living on the planet today. That's 7.7 billion. Again, very rough because – Longtime listeners, if you remember an earlier episode, uh, Matt, you actually pulled up the world population clock and we looked at how many people were born and died just in the 45 minutes that we spent doing the episode. I can't remember the exact number, but it was somewhere around 10,000 that were added while we recorded the episode. Yes, yes that's true. That's true. So welcome if you're listening. <laughs> so yeah. uh, all we have to do is a little bit of subtraction. Take that 7.7 billion away from the 108 billion who have ever been born, and we arrive at this number. Around 100 billion, 300 million human beings that have died on this planet. Overall, just on the, on, in the course of this ugly, brutal thing called human life on Earth. And so with this in mind, we can, we can easily see that we don't know where all 100 billion, 300 million graves are, right? And, and many, 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 many of those people didn't get a grave at all. You know, like, like you said, no, many were probably burned or uh, disposed of according to the cultural values or mores of the time. And when we think about this, it means it's reasonable to assume that many people got lost in the historical shuffle. As we said, Empires rise, they change names, um, the rulers change families, names of cities change. It's Istanbul, not Constantinople, and that's nobody's business, but it's sort of everybody's, etc. And not for nothing did Shelley write the poem Ozymandias, which is great. Oh, yeah. Look look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Despair. All of this sand. <laughs> look at it. Yes, yeah, uh, that's that's a poem that I, I hope is familiar with a lot of people. Um, it's quoted to great effect in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, recently debuting on Netflix. Oh, in the super bummer episode, right? Mm-hmm, in the super bummer vignette. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the guy does a great excerpt of it. He really does. Yeah. I say this every every time we bring up Ozymandias. It was my grandfather's favorite poem, and he would recite it all the time. Because he he was um, beautifully obsessed with his own mortality, and he mm. would just constantly 
talk about Ozymandias. Were you ever like, Grandpa, you're kind of freaking me out. <laughs> no, it was this, um, I don't know. It was a really charming thing about That's him awesome, in a weird man. way. Did he have a good voice for it? Oh, he did. <laughs> My grandpa just drank and grunted. <laughs> Well, perhaps he was reciting something, too. In his head. That's yeah. what, that was happening. <laughs> he didn't share it with me. So so we know that, unfortunately, we're never going to find the resting place of most people on the planet. That's, that's just the way things have shaken out for us so far. But what about the people who were a big deal? It, this is interesting what you're saying, Matt, about uh, your your grandfather having this uh, fascinating obsession with his own mortality because virtually every culture in our history in one way or another venerates the dead. Death is up there with birth, the one of the huge inexplicable things, right? Mm -hmm. Tons of people personally believe that they – know or have an inkling of what happens, right? And some people agree and many people don't, but no one has come up with something that everyone can get on board with, right? So it's this mystery and we do our best to um, honor or remember our loved ones or in some cases, in some gory cases, to vilify the people we despise. And each year, hundreds of millions of people make pilgrimages to one resting place or another. It could be like uh, Jim Morrison's grave in Europe, right? Absolutely. It could be um, – it could be a resting place of, of Lenin, you know, or – Yeah, and, and it's usually a famous or powerful person or a famously powerful person. Yes, yes, or a powerfully famous person. <laughs> there you right? go. Uh, so it seems reasonable then that since, since our species pays so much attention to this, it seems reasonable to assume that we can at least keep track of, if not everybody, the most important people who ever lived, I, right? You'd think – of course. Nah, it turns out, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> End of show. Roll credits. <laughs> we'll tell you why this is the case after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Not, not even counting the normal people, like, like, you and I, and like everybody who's ever lived. Uh, the over 100 billion normal people. Right, right. We have lost tons and tons and tons of incredibly influential historical figures over the ages. We can divvy it up into a couple of rough categories. Spoiler alert, we do not have the wherewithal to go into every single famous person who has disappeared or been hidden from history, but we can, we can touch on some interesting stories stories that are not Genghis Khan. Uh, we've got stories of misplaced corpses, stories of uh, rumored burial sites, and these are old, old rumors too, as we'll find. And then we also have stories of people who were purposefully buried in secret. So let's get, let's get it started with old Alexander the Great. Let's get it started in here. <laughs> yep. Alexander the Third of Macedon. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Great. Is was that a different way of saying Macedonia? <laughs> it became Macedonia. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Macedon. It was one of the world's uh, – this, this gentleman was one of the world's greatest military minds. We've probably heard of him just from classes way, way back in the day. Maybe you're in one right now listening to this. Uh, if so, shame on you. Put your phone away. <laughs> Not to be confused with our amazing cohort, Alex the Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Alex correct. Williams the Great. But uh, in this gentleman, Alexander III's short life, he established the largest empire the ancient world had ever seen up to that point. And uh, it lasted that way for a while. It was the great empire. Yeah, it's so weird when you read about these people. His, his moniker is not ironic. He was Alexander the Great. It was not like a little John name. And I think about conquerors like this. Every time I do something really dumb, like this guy was – died in his 30s, took over most of the known world at the time and uh, two weeks ago I fell asleep trying to put on a pair of pants. You know what I mean? It makes you think. It really, it really, really does. You know what I just recently <laughs> learned uh, – you know how much I love acronyms. GOAT, greatest of all time. Yes. So he could have been Alex. He's the original GOAT, Alexander the GOAT. That's what I'm going to call him. This is it. This is it. Well, here's the thing. Alexander the Great was just a regular old guy uh, doing all this conquering with his giant armies. Mm -hmm. You know, his numerous 
giant armies that roamed the planet. Died feeling like a failure. Yeah. Even though he did name a city after himself. Just goes to show. Just goes to show. We all have imposter syndrome. All of us. Oh. No no matter matter what, you know? No matter how much you achieve, how much you conquer, it's never enough unless you get right with yourself and love yourself. And so far, everybody has died. No matter what, <laughs> right. no matter what they do, it turns out life is a terminal condition. Except for that one guy, you remember. That's a different episode. Benjamin Two thousand years ago or so, you remember. We're talking about Space Odyssey. That one guy, I can't remember his name. All right, so <laughs> oh, and Henrietta Lacks. Ah, <laughs> uh, there you go. Immortality via cancer cells. Okay, so here's here's one of the big things. Mm-hmm. It's not exactly known or at least it's debated how he died but it is known when he died Mm -hmm. yeah yeah 323 bce in babylon but but you're raising an interesting point matt we we don't know too much about how he died was it malaria was it poisoning was it west nile virus uh there's a somewhat idealized romanticized account that says he died of heartbreak oh my gosh that's not a thing. <laughs> Come on. People have died of heartbreak. What? Right? Yeah. They need to suck it up and, you know, start going to the gym. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You've got all this advice for these ancient people. I really <laughs> do. I <laughs> really do. In, in, this time, in this time in human civilization, <laughs> just surviving was like being at the gym all the time. That's what I'm saying, though. Like, you, you know, with everything that was getting thrown at you, how are you going to die of a broken heart? That man. just sounds like giving up to That's me. That's surprisingly cold, man. Hey, listen. I've been through the ringer this year, okay, or last year. Yeah, okay. I, I see. I see what you're I've come out the other side, though. What, new year, new me. What's that quote? Be kind for Rewind. everyone is facing. I'll do it again. Be kind for everyone is facing a great battle. It's one of Chuck Bryant's favorite quotes, actually. That's a good oh. point. It's also one of those things about being – it's like you could re- rephrase that to be be nice to the, to the, the person, you, everyone you meet, because they could be dealing with something that you do not know about. Yeah, or, you know, the golden rule. Just treat them like you want to be treated. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so what happens? What ha- so, okay, so there's this idea, debatable, probably not true, that he died of good old-fashioned grief over the death of his best friend, Hephaestion. Hephaestion? I don't know. I heard uh, via the internet that mm-hmm. the H is silent, but I am no uh, Hephaestion, Hephaestion expert. <laughs> so, so uh, what what happens though? Like, I regardless of how he dies, he dies around three twenty BCE. So, what happens after that? Well, I mean, his corpse. He's the guy that conquered most of the world, at least the known the known world, as we said. And his body is going to be venerated in some way, in probably some, you know. Um, grandiose fashion that's just what's going to happen no matter what his body's going to be an artifact for for what comes after him now that the leader is dead because there's going to be a power struggle right yeah yeah absolutely uh, because the, in this case his body becomes a symbol in some ways possessing his body gives an implicit endorsement of your right to rule you know Ooh, what I mean? almost like, oh, that is so strange. Treating it almost as an heir in mm-hmm. a way or being an heir to it because you have it. Yeah, yeah. That's Possession strange. being nine-tenths of the law and so on. There you go. So first, his body's mummified. And for two years, it lay in state in a golden sarcophagus. And eventually, the people were fighting about where he should be placed, where he should be buried, make a decision, and they decide to bury him in Greece, in the first capital of the Macedonian kings. Whoa. In a place called Ege. And I again, the internet says I should pronounce it that way. It's spelled A-E-G-A-E. Mm. We're just going with it. But, but the plan goes awry. Isn't that correct? Oh, yeah. According to ancient sources, uh, his, his hearse that was actually, you know, his body was traveling in was hijacked of all things, near Damascus, and his corpse was taken to Egypt. Uh, and it was first sh- – or I guess it was first taken to Memphis in Egypt, mm. uh, not to, not the home of the other king. <laughs> right, way before Elvis. Yeah. And then from there, things start to get fuzzy. Sometime between 298 and 283 BCE, his body is 
taken to Alexandria, the city we mentioned earlier that he founded and named after himself. And then from there, he gets disinterred and put in at least two other places, the most famous being a mausoleum called the Soma. The Soma, which I believe is a – isn't that an herb that kind of makes you sleepy? Uh, I think there's a, a psycho, an antipsychotic medication called yeah. Soma or at least it's some kind of uh, – Valium-esque type drug. It's a drug in Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. That's exactly what I was thinking. Maybe it's not even real. I wonder if the real drug was named after the drug in Huxley because there really is a drug called Soma. Yeah. I think the real drug is a muscle relaxer. I think you're right. I want to say I've been prescribed it before but didn't take it. It's also like It's also a wonderful, uh, wonderful – I like – I like using this word for this uh, horror game, like a oh, yeah. psychological yeah. horror game. It's also a quite good Smashing Pumpkin song from before Billy Corgan lost his damn mind. Uh, oh. <laughs> the Soma is a brand name of a real drug. It's Carisoprodol. That's, that's the one. Right. Yeah, that is the one. So all that aside, drugs, Sorry. Smashing Pumpkins, uh, imaginary drugs. Um, this is where in this mausoleum, the Soma, the looting began, as is wont to happen with graves. It's basically like a big old target in the ground saying, hey, uh, free stuff Yeah, if you want to get your hands dirty and possibly your soul. Yeah. Well, and you know, Alexander found himself, or his body at least, inside a giant golden sarcophagus, I yeah. believe we mentioned. <laughs> it's not very uh, inconspicuous. Ooh. Yeah. And what do you do when you have a giant thing made out of gold? You it's... melt it down. Of course you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And that happened. But it got replaced with uh, like a glass sarcophagus or at least a, a glass container or some kind of crystalline container, which is fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I really would have liked to have seen that. Yeah, it's it's strange because you have to wonder, did they decide – did they decide that gold being you know a, a currency – at times, they decide that was just asking for trouble to make another golden thing, and they decided, well, glass is nice, and glass and crystal are expensive, but no one will steal it to try to pay for things. That I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, whoever is running the show now, you need a lot of gold and money to to pay for all the war that you're waging. That's right, because we're empire building here, people. Yeah, I mean, it's not cheap. It's game on. Even Cleopatra, who don't worry, shows up later in this story, took gold from this tomb to pay for her war against Octavian. There you go. And then things continued to get worse, which is kind of the story of humanity. Oh, man, no question about it. In 360 CE, uh, there were a series of unfortunate events that uh, included warfare, rioting, an earthquake, a tsunami. Um, All of this threatened or possibly even destroyed the tomb. Um, By the time St. John uh, Chrysostom visited in 400 CE, the tomb was lost. And ever since then, no one has been able to find the resting place of one of history's greatest conquerors. And Alexander the Great. R.I.P. Which is just out there somewhere. His remains exist Mm. because it takes a long time for bones in in the human body to break down. Yep. Mm. It's there. So traces of him may well be somewhere in some form, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, he is now also, it's fair to call him Alexander the Lost. Searches continue for his, uh, his remains or his tomb to date, but no one has found it. One thing we can say, and I don't want to sound too cynical about this, is that this this makes a lot of careers. The search for these sorts of lost sites can literally change the the course of human history. And so as we're speaking, if you're if you're an archaeologist or a budding archaeologist uh, researching this or something like this. We want to hear from you. Let us know what your search, your particular search is and let us know what um, what you think your fellow listeners would be surprised to learn about it. In the meantime, <laughs> let's fast forward. I just yeah. uh, right here before we get into it, I watched a movie with my wife last night and I couldn't tell you the name of it right now. It just showed up on one of the streaming sites and she had wanted to see it. it uh, it's all about this woman who goes back to college with her daughter to become an archaeologist. And I just happened – I had no idea that that was the plot. 
Is it a and, heartwarming rom com? Yeah, it. Is, I guess it's kind of that. But is yeah. it a psychological thriller? <laughs> no, <laughs> I couldn't even tell you who's in it or what what it was. Is it, it was, called I Bird was pretty Box? Sleepy. It was not Bird Box. Oh, I can't believe I'm, I can't even think of it right now. Yeah. Was um, it Police Academy Four? That's what it was. Okay. But anyway, it just happened to have an archaeologist uh, archaeology B plot line that uh, made, made me very happy. Nice. It's fascinating. I, I have a subscription to Archaeology magazine. Well, okay, look, I mine it for possible episodes in the future. I'm just going to be honest. I inexplicably have a subscription to Maxim. It just started coming. I can't get it to stop. That's funny. I, I think that's something that happens in the magazine industry that I'd love to look into because I had a, a former girlfriend who inexplicably began receiving a subscription to Muhair magazine. And, what is that? Uh, Muhair magazine is a lifestyle, fashion, interest thing for uh, the Latina population Whoa. in the U.S. and North America, I guess. And we couldn't get them to stop sending it. Like I emailed them, I sent an actual letter, and they still kept sending Muhair. Wow. As far as I know, you know, the uh, my ex and I are on good terms, so I could probably write to her and ask her. She <laughs> might still be getting Muhair. Like, they locked it down. There was no way out. Yeah, it's like she's moved three times, <laughs> still follows her wherever she goes. Oh. We, ha- we have that with Rolling Stone. F- somehow my wife still gets Rolling Stone sent to our house. We have not paid for that in d- – I don't even know how long. We should look into this. This is actually – I think we might have just uh, uncovered a new conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Is it worth sending us these magazines for the advertising that we are potentially looking at? You, that did just, just to just so just they can a, claim circulation. Right, yeah. just to boost numbers. What? That's fu- I'm fine. I love – Magazines. I canceled a lot of subscriptions because we receive them here at work, and mm-hmm. I, read, I read a ton of them. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that that may well be a future episode. Tell us about the magazine subscriptions that you are non consensually receiving, <laughs> please. And and I'll we'll hatch this conspiracy with you if you need it. It's a bit unethical. But if you have a subscription that you want people to think you are non-consensually receiving, write to us and we will totally pretend that you are non-consensually receiving it. Beautiful. Someone's like, no, I hate uh, Horseback Monthly. So it's, there's so many weird magazines. Yeah, gosh. OK, yeah, we're going to do an episode on that. Let's 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 definitely do that, and let's also jump forward to uh, a really cool figure in history, Mr. Thomas Paine. Yes, let's bring the Paine, Matt. What's what's the gist about this guy? Uh, well, he's an he's an Englishman, an England-born political philosopher. He's a writer. You certainly have heard about him. He supported revolutionary causes in both America and in Europe. Uh, he's perhaps best known for the old 1776 essay. Common Sense, along with other works such as The American Crisis, Rights of Man, and The Age of Reason, which is a really great read, actually, and mm. I didn't expect it to be when I when I cracked that thing open. Yeah, it's um, very readable. It's, it, it's, it's strange because I think we sometimes have a stereotype about things written in English in that yeah. period of time where they're going to be dry and every sentence is going to be three paragraphs long. Yes. And you're not going to understand most of it. Largely responsible for the uh, the philosophy behind Enlightenment thinking, yeah. and also our uh, our monument buddies, the Georgia Guidestones. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Big, big pain influence on those those guys. Huge. They were huge into the pain. <laughs> that is a weird mixed accent. And uh, again, my grandfather. The reason why I read it is because my grandfather, old Papa, brought it uh, brought it to my attention. It's a it's a good read, you know. And I know I know these the idea. There are certain trigger words people hear that make them not want to read things. One of those is essay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other is you know like reason or yeah. rights. Yeah, but but he was writing to communicate with the common people. You know what I mean? He wasn't trying to do uh, fancy acts of rhetorical gymnastics or acrobatics. But eventually, despite all the great things that he did, he also, spoiler alert, died. Oh, man. I was hoping it was going to go the other way. He's outside of the studio right now, Matt, waiting to talk to you. (gasps) I can only wish. About his multi-level marketing scheme. Oh, God. It's kind of a good news, bad news. Essential oils again. (laughs) Paint. So he died on June 8th, 1809 in New York City. And today he is the only founding father that does not have an official gravesite that what? you can go and visit there. Isn't that crazy? I'm so surprised. Why? 
<laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about what happened. Let's. So he was first buried in New Rochelle, New York on his farm after the Quakers refused him in a town that was very, very hostile towards this man. Yeah, because he criticized the Quakers during his lifetime for their pacifism and uh, for some of their other political beliefs. That's right. And in 1819, a Payne admirer named William Cobbett, himself a, a Democrat, um, a Democratic advocate rather, from England, saw the disrespect that Payne received where he was buried and decided to dig him up, took it upon himself to dig the man up. Just grabbed a shovel. Just grabbed a shovel. Heart wants um, what the heart wants. That's true. Uh, and to take him to England where he would be treated with more respect um, and he wanted to help spur the movement for democracy there. So I guess he saw this as sort of a symbolic act. Yeah, again, using a dead body for mm. almost a pol- – for definitely a political reason. And did it work? Uh, not really. There's still a monarchy in that area of the world. There's a parliament. <laughs> sure. Yeah, a house of lords and a house of commons that should tell you <laughs> what you need to know. Well, here in the States, we basically just have two houses of lords. So at least, I don't know. I don't know. Isn't that kind of the same thing? The the representatives represent the people, which would be the commons. And then the senators are more like the lords. Interesting. The senators on paper are also supposed to represent the people. That's fair. Ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> Psych. So over the years... Payne's body was was divided. It was split. Yeah. The bones were circulated across the planet. People were making relics of his remains. And now we have we, – we don't know where the bones are. We don't know where pieces of this uh, guy's body are. There's a Thomas Paine uh, foundation that has some of his hair and a bit of his brain. They admit to owning that. But there were unverified rumors that some of Thomas Paine's bones were cut into, get this, guy's buttons and sold to finance the revolution. Nice. But thing is kind of like in the Middle Ages when people would unscrupulously sell, you know, slivers of the Jesus – the cross on which Jesus Christ was crucified. Mm-hmm. There are enough slivers of that stuff to make an, an, a forest essentially. Or it's like those Passion of the Christ necklaces. Oh, yeah. Or uh, any and all holy water ever. <laughs> well, holy water you can – you could just make holy water. Well, that's right? what I'm saying. <laughs> was was it you? We were having. I was having this conversation with somebody about uh, hunting vampires in vampire films. There's almost always a priest, right? Yeah. And the priest has the ability to bless water, making it holy, and therefore uh, dangerous for vampires. Why don't they just like bless a water treatment system or like Ooh. a storm or something? Just a well. Yeah. How does it work? Just start getting buckets. Well, anyway, there there you go, uh, vampire producers who <laughs> check out our show. <laughs> well, uh, and you now yeah. that now that the Universal Life Church of California exists, mm. literally all of us have a massive defense of it against vampires because we can just get ordained within in a few minutes. Isn't that where your ordination yeah, is yeah. from? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. And me as well. Yeah. Exactly. What? We, Am I we, the only one that's not ordained? Yes, we've talked about yeah. this. What? Get on this train, right, buddy. I guess I got to get on the ordained train. Casey is ordained. Look at him. Mm-hmm. He's in He's in three or four different sects that he's a, a minister for and I think a, a priest, mm-hmm. a priestess, and what was the other thing? Um, a shaman? Bishop? Oh, a mage. Deacon? He's a mage. mage. What? Yeah. Are you making this up? Yes. No. Yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so back to this idea of counterfeiting relics. Very common in ancient days and surprisingly common still in the 1800s. There were more buttons that were purportedly Thomas Paine's bones that were sold than could have come from 10 bodies. You could, you could build a uh, jam band off the amount of buttons sold. Well, the, the skeletons of a jam band. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it makes you wonder who else was in that jam band that ended up as a Thomas Paine button. Yes, these were also the days of resurrection men, weren't they? Yeah. Do you think that any of those are still around and they're confirmed to be Paine buttons? Around, yes. Confirmed, no. Because how could you? Well, you could – there, there are there are some forms of testing you could do to verify it because there are rumors of a leg bone hanging in a wall of a tavern in England, and then there are other places that would be Thomas Paine, right? That's a large enough mm-hmm. sample where you could try to do some investigatory things. You could probably at least narrow down the time frame and the region. Is that kind of what you're saying? 
Right. Yeah. You yeah. could you could do some analyses that would indicate that. There are also some pieces that were claimed in Europe. It's possible that the skull has been located in Wales and then later moved to Australia. But to the point, no testing has confirmed this. And today, it seems that Payne's remains are largely scattered amidst various grisly collections. And some unscrupulous private collectors, there are more of these people than you think, my friends, uh, have pr- likely have pieces of Thomas Paine held in a secret collection today, sort of the way that a particular uh, secret society here in the United States collects skulls. That is – Wow. Creatively named the Skull and Bones, by the way. That's Ooh, who we're talking about. Yeah, that is true. They're just sitting there. Do you think maybe they have it? I don't know. I don't know. But you know what? Honestly, I would not be that surprised if they had a piece of it. It would make so much sense. Oh, yeah, that's Yale. Oh, dude, they totally have something in there. Hey, by the way, 23 mm. and Me, if you're listening, just whoever you are, oh, wherever yes, you are. I saw this news. Just go ahead and just get on there and just start just testing them bones. Especially go to the Skull and Bones first. <laughs> oh, I, then, I thought you were talking about the 23andMe news that just came out. No, Did you hear about no, this? No, what is this? Okay. Uh, super producers, could we get a breaking news sound cue? So 23andMe has teamed up with a drug manufacturer, a pharmaceutical giant named Glaxo. Like SmithKline? Uh huh. GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, they're giving the they're giving away the DNA test results of the five million something customers of Twenty Three and Me. What? Uh, GlaxoSmithKline will use this data to create research and create new drugs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? Called it. Wh- Called it. Uh, he said it was going to happen. Oh my god! I bl- wh- I got to tell Jason. Our executive producer, because he totally just did that. <laughs> well, uh, go ahead and preemptively thank him for possibly uh, contributing to Helping. important medical research. There you go. There you go. Against his will. Well, I mean, he, yeah. 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 He, he clicked the terms of service. <laughs> you know, uh, once you do that, it's like you don't know what's going to happen. That's oh, true. That's they true. told us. They told us in their offices they wouldn't do this. So should we take a little break before we get to rumored burial places? Sounds good. Let's do it. And we are back, as Matt would say, with no delay. He said it once, and I was taken by it. I don't know what it means, but I like it very much. Yeah, I mean, you can hear this is a very dry track. There aren't a lot of effects on it. That's uh, right. Definitely no delay. No delay. Also, it means that we're getting right to it. Uh, rumored burial places. Number one with a bullet on the list. The Queen. Nefertiti of ancient Egypt. She was a queen of Egypt, the wife of the pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled in the mid-14th century BCE. Um, So before Nefertiti and Akhenaten, Egypt had been a polytheistic civilization, worshipping an entire pantheon of anthropomorphic animal deities, ranging from the crocodile god Sobek, who was uh, depicted often as a man with the head of a crocodile, a staff in one hand, and an ankh, that uh, Egyptian symbol, the little loop with the cross through it um, in the other and with a weirdly a giant golden temple um, acting as some sort of larger than life crown sitting atop his scaly head Um, and then you had like gods like Anubis uh, who was depicted the god of the dead who was depicted very much the same way as Sobek was only with the head of a jackal and alas no golden temple headpiece yeah I love I love the idea of all the gods being a person with a different animal head that is really I, I actually really like that But here's the thing. Um, Akhenaten and his queen thought this whole worshipping multiple animal-headed gods was for the the literal birds, not not to be confused with the ibis-headed god of wisdom, Thoth, which is so fun to say. Thoth, it's just I got a TH on the front end and a TH on the back end. Yeah, man. I love that. Um, (laughs) I really do like Ibis or what what is it? Thoth? Thoth is the god. I've seen that in so many different places. Um, Anyway, the pharaoh thought it would be a good – a better idea, at least, to stick with just, let, let's call it one god. This will be easier. We can all, you know, know that there's one singular force that we can worship. Let's say, let's say the sun, that giant orange thing that just shoots light at us all the time and it makes us warm and happy. That's a good thing to worship. Let's do that. Seems legit. It's important to note that the sun disk 
also known as Aten, had already held a place in ancient Egyptian religion. And this dates way back to the Old Kingdom, where it was worshipped as an aspect of the composite god Ra Amun Horus. And this is uh, not to get too into the weeds about it, but Ra represents the daytime sun, Amun the sun of the underworld, Horus, of course, the rising sun. I love the idea of a composite god. That is so cool to me. It's, yeah really common in the ancient world. Yeah, yeah, but it's something we don't really think about. Every, every god is kind of their own thing. Oh, well, although it is kind of similar to the Trinity, like the right. Holy Trinity, right? Yeah. In monotheism, it's, they didn't make that up out of whole cloth, right? Monotheism being exactly where we're headed. Right, so this is this is, this is is backstory that we promise we'll deliver. So what, what happens next? Because you have to know this stuff about polytheism and monotheism, right? Yes. Akhenaten and Nefertiti attempted with all their might to obliterate all traces of, uh, and we're going to go Game of Thrones style and call them the old gods, by defacing carvings, uh, temples, and hieroglyphics that depicted them. And, you know, this didn't go over so well with, you know, the general public that had been worshiping these gods for so long. That's right. And, and neither did it last particularly long, right, Ben? That's right. It did not, it did not, uh, it wasn't as unsuccessful as uh, New Coke when that came out, but yeah. it was <laughs> it was still pretty. No, it was way, actually way worse than New Coke or Crystal Pepsi. Because I believe that Akhenaten reigned for seventeen years, um, and this whole worshiping the sun god business came in about three or four years into his reign. Mm-hmm. So. That's kind of a blip in ancient Egyptian history. Right. And the people who came after Akhenaten did their best to erase him and Nefertiti herself uh, from official history. And this this is important. So we don't talk about this as much as we should in the modern day. But it is true that the victors write the history textbooks you read and they are the ones who tell the stories of events in the past and it is at least back then it was alarmingly easy to erase people from history and Stalin did it uh, during his reign uh, the these su- subsequent pharaohs did it as well and you can see why they did it whether or not you agree with them it is true that this could pose a clear and present danger to their own legitimacy you know? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Nefertiti went right along with this whole deal because she actually disappeared from the historical record before her husband did, um, about 12 years into his reign. So it's possible that she might have died. There was a plague, as we know, that swept through Egypt around this time. Um, but there are some Egyptologists who believe that she was actually elevated to co-regent and changed her name, therefore kind of slipped out of the historical record into a new role. Um, oh. And then the name Nefertiti disappeared and she was named something that sounded remarkably like Nefertiti. I can't remember exactly what mm-hmm. it was, but it was sort of a – it was almost like a permutation of mm-hmm. the, the name Nefertiti. Um, and the thing is too, in a lot of the historical record or a lot of the depictions of she and her husband, they were very much on the same level. She already had a lot of power even before this possible elevation to literal co-regent, like vice president. Or really, I think a co-regent would be like – 50-50 co-ruler, right? Oh, yeah. So that's one possibility. But there's more. Many archaeologists believe that she could have been buried uh, in one of the tombs of what's now called Amarna, which was a new capital city that Akhenaten built during his reign. Whoa. Right, yeah. These tombs were plundered after Akhenaten's death. So it is possible that Nefertiti could have been reburied in the Valley of Kings. The the thing is, people will tell you that no matter how much animosity there was uh, for her and her husband, no pharaoh would normally deny a former ruler the burial accorded to their station, even even somebody that everybody hated like Akhenaten. And here's something that we – I don't think we've even mentioned this yet. She had a very important stepson. You may know him, Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun? Yes. King, that, old King Tut. That we have discussed in, mm-hmm. uh, before on this show about the, the curse that existed for his tomb. Oh, yeah. And I think inbreeding was uh, the curse of his lifetime. Have you seen the forensic analysis? Of, also, uh, I like to think of him as the originator of the phrase tut-tut. 
There you go. Which I'm a big fan. You are. <laughs> I like I like the single tut that you do, Ben. Oh, you just, thanks, oh, you said that's so that's very tut. Yes, it is when something is very tut. Yeah, when something's tut. Well, and the idea that she had such a famous and powerful uh son-in-law mm-hmm. that perhaps her body was actually you know, put in his tomb somewhere. That's right. Not to mention the fact that he uh, took over after his father-in-law died, and he is also the one um, that pretty much instantly started the process of going back, taking Egypt back to the old polytheistic ways and refurbishing all of those desecrated sites and monuments and uh, hieroglyphs and all of that business. But yes, you're absolutely right. This theory that um, Nefertiti's body was possibly buried in her son-in-law's tomb, there's one part of it that is super interesting is this idea that that tomb may have actually been meant for Nefertiti in the first place, but that Tutankhamun died unexpectedly quite young, the boy king, right? Because one piece of evidence behind this, it's all, it seems a little conjectury, but it's that it was a much smaller tomb than some of the other ones, and that if it was for a woman, they might have considered it diminutive, less than, so they might have made it smaller. Mm. But you could also argue that it was for a boy, um, and that you could say the same thing in that respect. But here's the thing. This theory was put forth by an Egyptologist named Nicholas Reeve, who's the director of the Amarna Royal Tombs Project. Um, He commissioned some radar scans of the site of Tutankhamun's tomb, um, and they supposedly showed evidence of two secret chambers complete with masonry walls and, uh, quote, metallic and organic substances – But there are other experts who aren't so sure that this was definitive of what he wanted it to be, kind of. Yeah. And then, of course, as soon as a theory like that comes along, you've got somebody else who comes along and says, well, I'm going to do some scans and we're going to – or we're at least going to re-look at the scans that were done and see what we have here. And according to, you know, this other group of scientists, in this case, it's uh, Lawrence Conyers who's at the University of Denver – he he's an anthropology professor, by the way. He's looking at these scans and he's saying it. Uh, quote: It does not appear that these GPR ground penetrating radar data have been processed, or that any of the so-called anomalies are visible in the raw data that are provided. This guy, by the way, I saw this in every thing that cited this dude. He wrote the book on ground penetrating radar. There you go. It's going to make a joke about penetrating the ground. Uh, via the that old poet laureate of the West. But we'll go back to um, – let's go back to the quote. He says, My suggestion to those who are collecting it is that they release the raw, da- the raw data for some peer review by other GPR people before they allow the antiquities people to hold a press conference about all the riches that might be in these supposed tombs. That peer review – would cut down all the speculation and critiques that have been going on around the email for f- the last few days, as there might be as there might be as many scientists who could reach a consensus in advance of the speculation in the press. This was in 2016, by the way. I, I was not able to find any um, more recent updates to this, but in 2016, Egypt's Antiquities Ministry refused to follow Conyers' advice or acknowledge another series of scans that were carried out by National Geographic or with their assistance, saying they would independently test the site. Uh, instead, um, Reeve and his uh, co-author were allowed to present present their findings unchallenged um, it, within the Egyptology community in Egypt. So uh, I don't know, Ben. We were talking about this off air. Like it seems like the ministry here is protecting their like what tour, tourism kind of boon that this could produce. I'm, I'm confused as to why they would be so secretive or not allow other perspectives in this uh, mm. in this discussion. Could it be grant money coming in from NGOs or some other thing? Perhaps? It could be grant money. It could be a UNESCO thing. It could be it could be any number of things. We do know that in some cases. Uh, state organizations like this are incentivized or incented, depending on which word you prefer, to preserve a certain status quo. It happens. Um, it happens as well in Central America and Mexico, where in some cases, some countries don't want a lost site to be found because then they are responsible for restoring and maintaining it. It also could, and this is somewhat depressing, it could just be a matter of corruption. They may have just not greased the right palms yet. Mm. Uh, But they did allow him to like they just didn't respond, right? Yeah, no. I mean, they they definitely did. It wasn't even the the father of uh, GPR or whatever. He he was just kind of weighing in on this, mm-hmm. and I think he was even quoted at another time saying, 
he was considering going and conducting some tests himself, but he's glad he didn't because the whole thing seems like a real debacle and, you know, didn't want to fly halfway around the world to be part of this kind of total ship show. Now, I know that as of 2018, uh, professors were still fighting over a 3D image that was constructed of someone who was presented as Nefertiti, a a 3,400-year-old mummy that was identified as the younger lady. But that was discovered back in 1898, and then TV producers got a hold of it. So, oh, boy. Yeah, so I, drama. I wouldn't trust it. Well, point being is this is still a hotly contested uh, issue, and um, I think the backstory of this whole Nefertiti Akhenaten situation is really interesting and kind of points to uh, how history can kind of obscure the truth you know, based on ideological disagreements. Mm -hmm. And although you didn't hear it uh, through the magic of editing, we just had a break off air ourselves. And we hope that you are enjoying this episode because time got a little bit ahead of us. We have more famous tombs, but we are going to have to save those for another day, the second part of what has become a two-part episode. We will rejoin you next time as we stay in Egypt and travel further throughout the ancient and not-so-ancient world. In the meantime, uh, we have to ask, while, while you're waiting on part two, what benefits do you see these searches having for modern civilization? You know, some people, oddly enough, I don't know about you guys, but this surprised me. Some people have argued in a very utilitarian way, we should just let the past die and focus on the future. Why spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars finding these long gone, long neglected tombs when there are people starving. You know what I mean? In the real world. Should we spend that money saving the people who are alive instead of finding the venerated corpses of people who have died? Or, you know, spend it on sending us all to Mars. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) There we go. Uh, In case Elon is tuning in. And secondly, do you think it's possible that someone alive today might know the location of one of these graves or some of these remains? And if so, why would they continue to keep it a secret? Yeah. And have you ever come across bones that are purportedly from Thomas Paine? We want to know about it. <laughs> Tell us about your buttons. Don't send it to 23 and Me, I guess, but, you know, maybe send it to one of the other ones. Do you think Ancestry is clean so far? I think it's an inevitable situation. Well, send it somewhere. I also don't think it's necessarily bad. I, I mean, agree. what do you guys think? I agree. This is This is valuable stuff, and we have episodes about that. You can find them all on our (laughs) website, stufftheyonwantyoutoknow.com, or wherever you find your favorite podcast. And you can send us the answers to those questions uh, via – I mean, we're we're all over the social meads, right? We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Social M-E-A-D-S, social meads. (laughs) Yes, social meads, ales, and IPAs. Yeah, yes. Uh, As you said, conspiracy stuff on most conspiracy stuff show on Instagram. Uh, If you want to maybe – well, there's all those ways you can get a hold of us. Check out Here's Where It Gets Crazy. That's our – one of our Facebook pages. It's our – I guess more of our member group that you have to join. The only thing you have to know to get in is our names. And it is so surprising how many people get it so wrong. When trying to join that page. <laughs> I don't know about you, Matt, but I really enjoy the, the – the thing is, look, the question is, can you name the host of this show? You know? Like yeah. Ben, Matt, Noel, super producer, Paul, or Casey. Thanks for coming, by the way, Casey. Uh, we also, just for a peek behind the curtain, uh, if we think the answer is funny enough, yes, if yes. we actually laugh, we'll, we'll be like, ah, go – Come on, let him in. Yeah, if we can tell it's an inside joke or something, they were like, okay, they know what's going on. What are some of the weird nicknames you guys saw? Uh, Mostly what I see is just strange pronunciations or uh, writings of Noel's name. Just really interesting. N-O-A-L, N-O-L-E. And U-U-L, I think yeah, I've null. seen. Yeah, I like that one. That was, that's a good one. There was also K-N-O-W-L. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's one of my favorite things, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you can join the conversation with us, most importantly, with your fellow listeners. And uh, we, we, we drop by there, too. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. And if you don't want to do that stuff, give us a call. 1-833-STDWYTK. That's 1-833 stuff they don't want you to know, by the way. And there are numbers there. You just dial them. And you'll, you know, leave a message if you'd like. And you may get on the air. If you don't want to do any of that, the one thing you can do is send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at howstuffworks.com. 